Next, I'm going to talk about flight stacks and which one to buy. Flight stacks consist of an electronic speed controller board, or ESCs for short, a flight controller, and sometimes a video transmitter. In my build, the video transmitter is a separate purchase to the stack, so I'll be covering that later. Flight stacks come in three main sizes of 30mm by 30mm, 20x20 and 16x16mm. As this is a 5 inch build, I'll be using a 30x30 stack. However, you can use a 20x20 stack, but I'll cover why that's not always a good idea, especially for a freestyle model a bit later. ESCs that are part of the flight stack are known as the 4-in-1 ESC board because we need an ESC for each of the four motors. We did used to use individual ESCs placed along each arm, and some people still do this, but it's more convenient to have them on a single board. The downside being that if an ESC blows, you have to replace the entire board. However, 4-in-1 ESC boards are pretty reliable these days, and in general they are cheaper than for individual ESCs. As previously mentioned, ESCs control the speed of each individual motor by converting direct current from the quadcopter's battery into an alternating current with three phases. They do this using components called MOSFETs, which act as switches that open and close to energize different parts of the motor's stator in sequence, causing it to turn. Each ESC has its own microcontroller and a piece of software flashed to it, in this case BL Halley, that knows the position of the motor because as the motor turns it also generates its own voltage back to the ESC known as back EMF, which it can use to sense where to fire the next electromagnetic stator and it does this by opening and closing the MOSFETs very quickly. But what also happens in the process is something called a voltage spike, and that's because a brushless motor is an inductor, meaning that the motor coil stores energy, and when the MOSFET switches off, the current in an inductor can't instantly change. So when the MOSFET switches off, there's still current flowing through the coils with nowhere to go. So when the MOSFET switches off, the voltage starts to build up, and all of the stored energy turns back into electrical energy and we get a voltage spike. And is this important to know? Well, I think so because I like to know how things work, but all of this switching, the back EMF and voltage spikes causes electrical noise to be present which can interfere with the flight controller as well as causing visual interference through to our video feed. And what suppresses that noise reaching to our other components is how much filtering has been built into the ESC circuit. And you tend to find that really cheap, poor quality ESCs have very little filtering on the board itself. And they usually substitute surface mounted ceramic capacitors, which filter out the noise, with a single electrolytic capacitor on the battery terminal, which does work, but it's really a patch for proper filtering. The problem is that 4-in-1 ESC boards don't have as much room on them for components as individual ESCs do. So what a lot of brands do now is they combine ceramic capacitors on the board itself with an additional electrolytic capacitor on the battery terminals for good measure. But really, a decent ESC shouldn't need an external capacitor. So if you have the cash, I find that the Airbot F4 and Typhoon 32-bit ESCs are a good combination because the ESCs have enough filtering on them to not need an external capacitor for its rated 6S voltage. This brings me onto the subject of 20x20 ESCs, and for a first build I would avoid them, just because there's even less room for decent filtering on those boards. I have had some success with HLRC's 20x20 boards, but mainly on lighter race quads, so for a first build I'd stick with 30x30 ESCs.
any board that relies on an external electrolytic capacitor, as I said before, is using it as a patch, and they do eventually start to wear out compared to surface-mounted ceramic capacitors. You can think of a capacitor as a buffer that temporarily stores electric charge a little bit like a battery. However, it can't store anywhere near as much energy as a battery, but it can charge and release its energy much faster than a battery. And because it acts as a buffer, the voltage gets smoothed out in the process, eradicating the noise caused by all of the switching from the ESCs and the back EMF and voltage spikes. However, the size of a capacitor is directly related to how much it can store. So if you have got a lot of noise, then the capacitor needs to be big enough, otherwise it won't filter everything out. The size of a capacitor is measured in farads, but because we're using small capacitors, we use microfarads, which is a UF symbol. Generally, for a 5-inch quadcopter that already has decent filtering on its ESCs, can get away with 450 to 1000 microfarads. However, some really poor quality ESCs have been known to need bigger ones. The other measurement of a capacitor is its voltage rating, and this one's quite important because voltage spikes produced by our motors can be double that of the input voltage, so a 6S battery fully charged is around 25 volts, therefore ideally you would need a 50 volt rated capacitor because electrolytic capacitors will actually explode if the rated voltage is exceeded. In fact, you can see at the top where where the capacitor is designed to split open when it explodes. However, you will find many stacks have capacitors rated for 35 volts or lower, and this is because the ESC has its own built-in filtering and the external capacitor is just there to filter out what's left. Some capacitor brands are better than others as well. In the past, I bought some really cheap electrolytic capacitors off eBay, and when I put them on my build, they didn't filter out anything whatsoever. But Panasonic do a really good job, and they're my personal favorite brand. You can get them easily in the EU. And Rubicon are another good brand to get in the US if your stack didn't come with one. Some stacks come with a battery connector and a lead in the box, but if it doesn't, then you'll need to buy some XT60 connectors and some lengths of 12 to 14 gauge silicon wire. I find that 14 gauge does the trick. We need the wire to be thick enough to carry the large amount of current demanded by the quadcopter, and if the wire is too thin, it can get very hot and start to melt things, which is why we want to use silicon wire because it doesn't melt, and it's also much easier to use than plastic wire coating which we want to avoid at all costs. You will need some sort of heat shrink to protect the positive and negative terminals from shorting on anything else as well. XT connectors are standard in the hobby. The 60 in XT is its amp rating, but in reality, they can take around 120 amps before they start to bottleneck. And the rating goes the same for XT30, which can handle around about 87 amps, and XT90, which can do about 170 amps. The stack I'm going to be using in this build is the iFlight Success E, which is a budget stack that has decent filtering built into the ESC, so it's a nice middle ground to start off with, but as a rule, if you don't see many surface-mounted ceramic capacitors, which are these components here, built into the ESC, then it's most likely going to have noise issues that sometimes can't be resolved. And even though most times you don't find out until the model is is built, whether it's got any noise issues. When buying a new stack, the first thing I'm looking for are an abundance of ceramic capacitors. This year I've seen some all-in-one boards for 5-inch models where the flight controller and ESCs are all on the same board, which seems like a good idea. This is Flywoo's version of it, and I was tempted to try it out in this build, but I think there's just too much that could go wrong, especially for a beginner build, because it will mean if an ESC blew or if we shorted something on the flight controller, then we have lost everything.
The Success E-Stack comes with an F4 flight controller and F4 is just the version of the microprocessing chip just like computer chips are labelled. The bigger the number, the faster and better the chip is. So we started at F1 and F3 which have been discontinued now mainly. I mean you can still fly them of course but it's a pain when it comes to the software and now we are on F4 and F7 and there's some H7 boards as well now. But I've chosen the F4 for its price. If you can afford it then an F7 will give you less aggro and buying one with built-in Bluetooth is really handy as well because you can configure it in the field through your phone and you don't need a computer. F4 processors don't have the ability to invert signals so they have to have a dedicated pad that has a component inverter on it meaning that we only have one pad to solder inverted FR Sky receivers to whereas F7s can invert or uninvert the signal for any of its pads which sounds complicated but it's not and I'll explain that later on in the build. Flight stacks usually come with their own dampening solutions known as grommets or gummies which filter out vibrations from the motors through the frame so that they don't reach the built-in gyro on the flight controller. Otherwise we get twitches and unwanted flight characteristics that can't be tuned out. If for whatever reason your stack didn't come with these then make sure you buy some otherwise you could run into problems. As for the flight controller itself, its job is to convert our input to fly the quadcopter by taking the information it has from its gyro to know its position in the air and convert that into signals to send to each motor. It has an on-screen display chip which we can use to tell how much battery we've got left to our video goggles as well as how far we can fly and many other things. Now one of the most important things for me in a build is how clean the video feed is going to be which I've talked about from the ESC point of view but if a flight controller has its own voltage regulator specifically designed for a video transmitter then you're going to get the best video quality. Now unfortunately the iFlight budget stack doesn't have one of these pads. It's got a 5 volt regulator which we would usually use just to power up our receiver. However you can get a 5 volt TBS Unify video transmitter that runs off 5 volts but the majority of powerful video transmitters run off 7 volts and above so I'll be connecting my video transmitter direct to the battery also known as VBAT. So when it comes to filtering I'm purely going to be relying on the filtering on the ESC board to filter out any noise through to the video. However I've used this stack before and had really good results from it. The only budget stack I can think of that has a separate regulator for the video transmitter is the Diatone Mamba F4. So you can check that one out, but generally you're best paying a little bit more for an F7 with that feature. So the same power source in my build is going to power up the flight controller and my video transmitter at the same time, which can still cause some noise to filter through to the video. Hopefully that won't be the case, on my previous builds it has performed well but a dedicated regulator built into the board regulates the voltage anywhere from 7 to 9 volts and you could power up a video transmitter separately from the main battery voltage to give another level of noise filtering. It's also known as a BEC which stands for battery eliminator circuit and it comes from the days where multiple batteries had to be used to power up different components running off different voltages. So a regulator would eliminate the need for multiple batteries and it works by switching the main input voltage on and off until it levels out at the desired voltage. And you do have to be careful with this though because sometimes the switching from this regulator can cause noise itself and this is why I say you're best spending a little bit more on a more premium stack because I've previously had problems with the Mamba stacks in in the past where the switching causes noise to filter through to the video anyways and you have to add a separate capacitor. But in a well-built flight controller it will help the situation and filter out any noise from the system.
This is why I like the AirBot stack because the flight controller does have a dedicated 8 volt regulator for a video transmitter and I'm yet to see a build with this stack that produces any noise. And you can add your own regulator if you're having noise problems but it's usually quite messy and by the time you've finished you might find that it would have been cheaper to spend more on a flight controller with one built in. Just make sure that it's rated for at least two amps otherwise it might not provide enough current for a powerful video transmitter and you might get something called a brownout which essentially means that there isn't enough current to supply all of the power in the system so you're video transmitter will just power off and go blank. Another thing to consider is if the flight controller has enough UARTs for your build. Now as this is a beginner build you don't really need to worry about that because I've chosen that for you. A UART can be thought as an extra USB port except that we are soldering wires into it rather than plugging something in. And they can be used for things like a GPS unit and telemetry. Our budget stack has enough UARTs for what we need. The flight controller has software flash to it, in this case Betaflight, which we configure via a computer through a USB connector. There are many other flight control softwares out there, but Betaflight is the most popular one and it's also free. You will hear of others such as Emu Flight and paid ones like KISS and Flight One, but Betaflight is what we're going to be using and learning. The same goes for BL Halley for our ESCs. You will hear the terms BL Halley S and BL Halley 32 in the description of an ESC. BL Halley 32 ESCs are 32 bit and generally have more features and telemetry options than BL Halley S ESCs. They also use two different types of configurators, but the iFlight Success E stack has BL Halley S ESCs and they are still really capable ESCs and will be good enough for our build. You will also see an amp rating on ESCs such as 45 amps and this is how much current draw each ESC can handle individually from the quadcopter and you only really need to worry about this when it comes to smaller builds because our XT60 connector will bottleneck at around 120 amps anyway with spikes of maybe 150 amps when we go up on the throttle but that current draw will quickly come down and ESCs usually have a 10 to 20 amp burst rating for a number of seconds anyway. So if you divide 4 by 150 amps for each ESC, that comes to 39 amps. So a 5 inch could easily get away with 30 amp ESCs with a burst rating because we're not always going to be flying at 120 or 150 amps. That's just going to be present when we go up on the throttle for a couple of seconds in which case will probably kill our battery before our ESCs. Anyways, the amp rating for ESCs is usually calculated for a 4S voltage input. It's not always the case. Some manufacturers give the current rating for a 4S and some the current rating for a 6S, but we're going to be drawing less current with a 6S battery anyways. So 40 amps and above per ESC should be ample for a 5-inch build.